This episode is sponsored by Epic Loot Jewelry. Get unique pieces inspired by Norse culture at epiclootshop.com. Link is in this video's description. What is going on, my fellow Norse nerds? My name is John Solo, and I just want to give you a heads up. If Thor is your patron god, then this probably won't be your favorite episode. Because today on Mythology Explained, I'm giving the spotlight to his underappreciated arch nemesis, Jormungandr, the World Serpent. Now to those on the other side of the spectrum, the casual fans of the Norse mythos whose knowledge comes from pop culture and the odd Snapple fact, no judgment by the way, that was me only a year ago, you may not even have known that Thor has a nemesis because Jormungandr hasn't really been given much representation in pop culture. I think they do an incredible job portraying him in 2018's God of War and made some really cool creative decisions with his story, but he is completely absent from Thor Ragnarok despite his sister Hel and brother Fenrir getting to play key roles. To be fair, he's not even that prolific in the few Norse texts that we have, but the myths he's featured in are as entertaining as they are hilarious so it's about time more ear holes hear them. Those of you who love mythology and folklore and want more content like this delivered to your sub box every week, be sure to sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons to your preferred pantheon. And now, the messed up origins of Jormungandr. So as is the case with every episode of Norse Mythology Explained, about 99% of the info you're going to hear today comes from two sources, and they're two of the only sources we have for this stuff. They are the Poetic Edda, a compilation of Norse poetry written by a variety of unknown authors, and the Prose Edda, a collection of myths written by Icelandic poet Snorri Sturluson. The first part of the Prose Edda is called the Gilfaginning, and like many of the great folklore collections, it contains an overarching narrative one where a king named Gilfi is conned out of some land by an Aesir goddess. In a rage, he disguises himself as an old man and sets off for Asgard so he can ask the gods face to face if they always get what they want through lies and deceit. But Odin learns of the king's plan and decides to trick Gilfi, thus proving his point. The Allfather conjures a huge palace in Gilfi's path, then disguises himself as the three kings in charge named High, Justice High, and Third. When Gilfi enters the palace, they tell him he has to prove his wisdom if he wants to leave and the way he does this is by asking questions about the nature of the world according to Norse beliefs. They talk about the assembling of Midgard, the eight other realms that are supported in Yggdrasil's branches, the creation of humans, and eventually the birth of Loki's children. The Aesir knew that any offspring of Loki, who surpasses other men in the craft called cunning and cheats in all things, were going to make trouble for them if left to their own devices. So when Odin learned that Loki recently had several babies with a giantess named Anger Bolda, he wanted to nip the situation in the bud. He sent the Aesir to the children's home in Jotunheim to retrieve them, and they came back with quite the crew of misfits, a wolf, a serpent, and a girl who appeared to be half dead. The oldest was the wolf. He was named Fenrir, and while the Aesir treated him with compassion, Passion as a puppy, they eventually came to fear his massive size and had him bound with enchanted ribbon. Hel, the half-dead broad, was the youngest. Odin gave her the responsibility of looking after the dead who don't go to Valhalla, knowing full well that'd keep her too busy for any mischief-making. The middle child was your boy Jormungandr, whose name literally translates to huge or mighty monster. Immediately after meeting him, Odin threw him into the deep sea that surrounds all lands. While this decision allowed the Aesir to put off dealing with Jormungandr for now, residing in the ocean allowed him to eat as much of whatever he wanted, and the unrestrained serpent was able to grow to his full potential. He came to be so large that he could encircle the entire earth and bite the end of his own tail. Then, from that point onward, he earned himself another terrifying epithet, Mithgarth Sormer which roughly translates to Midgard Serpent. I'm usually not one to question the Allfather's judgment, but in hindsight, it doesn't seem like that was the best way to dispose of Jormungandr, whose rivalry with Thor would ultimately lead to both of their deaths. Before we dive into the myths that detail the origins of that rivalry though, I wanna say thank you to the sponsor who made this episode possible, Epic Loot Jewelry. December has officially started, everybody. That means the holidays are right around the corner and the time for giving is upon us. So what better way to show your fellow Norse mythology fanatics how much you love them than gifting them something that truly represents their passion. That's where our friends at epiclootshop.com come in. They make unique pieces inspired by the history of and symbology found in Norse culture. Over on their site, you can find truly beautiful tankards and goblets featuring Odin, Loki, and Yggdrasil, the world tree, chains inspired by mighty Aesir weapons, like Thor's hammer Mjolnir and Odin's spear Gunnir and gorgeous rings with real runes carved into them. 
In honor of today's subject though, I wanna give some special attention to their line of Jormungandr inspired products. They've got some brand new necklaces and pendants on sale right now, and the craftsmanship is just incredible, almost like it was handcrafted by a real Viking. My personal favorite of the bunch though has to be this world serpent necklace. I've honestly never seen anything like it, and the idea of Jormungandr wrapping himself around my neck instead of the world is so cool to me. Whether you're looking for bracelets, incense burners, or something in between, Epic Loot has got you covered. So treat your inner Viking or your fellow Vikings to something they'll appreciate and can't find anywhere else. You can either go to epiclootshop.com or hit the link in this video's description. Like I said, they've got a ton of sales going on right now, so your timing couldn't be better. Just make sure to enter my code JOHNFREE when you go to checkout to get free shipping on your entire order. Now let's get back to learning about Jormungandr and the origins of his rivalry with Thor. Thor's first encounter with Jormungandr can be found in a chapter of the Prose Edda called Thor's Adventures, and it follows he and Loki as they travel to Jotunheim with the intention of having an adventure. Now, I don't want to go into too much unnecessary detail with this myth because it's very long and our focus today is on Jormungandr, who's only actually present for a few moments in this one. But don't worry, I'll be covering the full story in its own dedicated episode and the messed up origins of Thor, which will be coming out in a few months. That being said, it is he and Thor's first interaction with each other and basically the birth of their rivalry. So I do think that part is worth mentioning. So basically what happens is Loki, Thor, and Thor's two servants, Thialfi and Roskva, travel east into Jotunheim. And when they arrive at the hall of a giant called Utgarthr Loki, they're told they'll have to prove their talents if they want hospitality. One of the talents Thor tries to prove is his strength. So he's challenged by Utgarthr Loki to lift his house cat off the ground, something he says that all giants can do with ease. Thor is able to get the cat on his shoulder without much of a struggle, then he lifts it upward into the air. But the god finds that no matter how high he reaches, the cat just arches its back in the same direction. And as a result, he can barely get its paw off the ground. Unfortunately, that means he failed the challenge, but we learn at the end of the story that the contest was rigged. That wasn't actually a cat that Thor was trying to lift. Utgarth or Loki had used powerful magic to create that illusion, but in reality, Thor was holding the world serpent. In fact, when the cat's paw was no longer on the ground, Utgarth or Loki and his boys got a little freaked out because for the first time since it matured, the world serpent couldn't reach its own tail. Now, even though Thor was happy to learn that he wasn't too weak to pick up a cat, he was still furious about being tricked. So he immediately grabbed hold of Mjolnir and swung it right at Utgarth or Loki's face. Face. Much to his frustration though, by the time he would have made contact, the giant had already vanished into thin air. So the trio had no choice but to return to Asgard with their heads hanging in defeat. Now our next story, which is about Thor's second and final encounter with Jormungandr before they fight at Ragnarok, can go down in one of two ways, depending on the source. If you pick up where we left off last section and continue reading the prose Edda, you'll learn that being tricked by the giants left a bad taste in Thor's mouth, and he wanted to have another adventure right away to cleanse his palate. However, the poetic version of the story called Heimskvida, which translates to Heimir's poem, has a completely different setup. It opens with the Aesir gods returning from a hunting expedition expedition and desperately wanting something to drink. They use blood magic to learn that the giant Aegir, who personifies the sea, has a big collection of cauldrons, so Thor heads over to his abode and orders him to make them some brew. Now Aegir doesn't appreciate being bossed around like that, so to make Thor earn it, he tells him he has to find a big enough cauldron to satisfy the Aesir's thirst. The gods didn't know where they could find such a cauldron, but Tyr, the Norse god of war, pulls Thor aside and tells him that his father, Hymir the Wise, has a huge cauldron that's a mile deep, and they can borrow it if they play a few tricks. So Tyr and Thor promptly left Asgard, dropped off Thor's goats at a lava giant named Egil's house, and traveled to the east of Olivagar near the end of the sky, where Hymir lived. Interestingly, in the Prosetta's version, Thor travels to Hymir's alone, there's no mention of a cauldron, and the giant's relation to Tyr is never acknowledged, though we can safely assume that it still applies. Back to the Poetic Edda, the first person the pair encounters in Hymir's house is Tyr's grandmother, who's described as ugly with 900 heads. 
In steep contrast to her was Tyr's mother, who was said to be golden with a pretty face. When daytime turns to evening, Tyr's mother orders him and Thor to hide under a cauldron because Hymir, his father, hates guests. And when he finds out that Thor, the infamous giant slayer, is in his own home, he's going to be furious. Again, this detail is exclusive to the poem. When Hymir returns and learns they have guests, he starts stomping around the house, splitting beams of wood, flipping tables, smashing pots and cauldrons alike to try and find where they're hiding, but eventually he wears himself out and Tyr and Thor are safe to reveal themselves. After greeting them with as little enthusiasm as he can muster, Hymir reluctantly orders for three bulls to be killed for their dinner, and Thor, ever the polite guest, eats two of them whole, leaving Tyr, his mother, and his father to split the last one three ways. Naturally, Hymir was pissed about this and realized that Thor would be an expensive guest to feed, so he says they should go fishing. This is in contrast to the prose edda where Thor suggests the idea himself, likely because he wants to redeem his failed attempt to lift your Gonder by fishing him out of the sea. I'm happy to say that what happens next can be found in both versions though. Thor asks if he can borrow some bait and Hymir tells him to go find his own in the cattle field. Now it's likely that Hymir wanted Thor to go searching through cow shit to find some big juicy maggots he can find, but that just wasn't Thor's style. Instead, he walked right up to the biggest bull he could find, grabbed hold of its horns and twisted its head off. Then, when he brought the head to Hymir, the giant looked at it for a minute, let out a deep sigh and said, That was my favorite bull. And here I thought there was no way you could do more damage outside than you did inside. If only Hymir knew what was in store though. He rowed the boat out to sea and caught two whales on one hook and figured that'd be enough to get them through the next few days. But Thor had his own agenda. The mighty god cast out his own bait and not long after, who else would bite it but Jormungandr? Now the prose version of the story goes into a bit more detail about Thor's struggle to reel in his big catch. See, after that hook sunk into the roof of his mouth, Jormungandr realized he had been tripped and pulled the line so hard that it almost sent Thor flying out of the boat. But the god caught himself on the gunwale in the nick of time and now he was pissed. He stomped on the floor of the boat so hard that his foot actually broke broke through the bottom of it, forcing him to stand on the ocean floor. Which funnily enough, is a scene that's been depicted in some of the oldest Viking art we found, which shows you how long the story was part of their culture. Next, Thor gives his fishing line a powerful yank upward and pulls the serpent's head out of the water. And as he laid his eyes into the monstrous beasts for the very first time, it spit venom directly into his face. The god could feel his skin slowly burning away layer by layer, but his rage and hatred for the serpent allowed him to power through. And Instead of wiping the venom away, he grabbed hold of his hammer and swung it down with all of his might. Now what happens next depends on what version of the story you read. In the Poetic Edda, Thor's mighty hammer crashes into the skull of Jormungandr, causing his body to go stiff and sink back into the sea. But the Prose Edda isn't quite as climactic. In that version, before Thor can swing his hammer down, the terrified Hymir reaches out with his knife and cuts the fishing line, setting the world serpent free. As you would expect, the short-tempered Thor is immediately pissed about this, and to pay Hymir back for his intervention, he delivers a solid right hook that sends the giant falling backward into the ocean. Then the god just wades back to shore and this version of the story ends. The poem continues on for a while, but none of what's left has anything to do with Jormungandr, so I'm gonna keep it simple. After making their way back to Hymir's house, the giant tells Thor that rowing a boat and pulling up a fish mean nothing. To prove his strength, he must break his chalice. So Thor does what he's told by smashing it on Hymir's head. Naturally, Hymir is annoyed about his plan backfiring and losing his favorite drinking glass in the process, but he seems to realize that fighting Thor would not be a good idea right now. So he tells him to just take the cauldron they came for and get the fuck out. The games aren't over yet though, because a few hours after Thor and Tyr started their journey home, they noticed that Hymir and an army of lava giants were chasing them down. You might think the two would be worried about this, but Remember, it's Thor and the God of War, neither of whom are strangers to violence. So they take out their weapons and kill the giants with relative ease. Unfortunately, the poem doesn't clarify what happens to Hymir specifically, but I don't think it's a bold assumption to say that his fate was similar to the armies that he brought with him. After that distraction was dealt with, the duo picked up Thor's hammer from the lava giants, delivered their shiny new cauldron to Aegir's Hall, and from that point onward, the gods would go there to drink good beer every winter's day.
One of the most unique parts of Norse mythology is their belief in Ragnarok. For the uninitiated, Ragnarok is the series of events that culminate into an epic battle in the end of the world. After Loki tricks the blind god Hod into killing his brother Baldur with a dart of mistletoe, Fimble Winter commences, and the world is forced to endure three seasons of winter in a row, with three more winters preceding those. Then, when the golden, crimson, and soot-red roosters start to crow, Heimdall will blow his Gialar horn, and Ragnarok will be a upon us. Now remember, Jormungandr was completely left out of the MCU's Ragnarok, and while that might be because in the comics Thor kills him before Ragnarok happens, I still feel like they could have found a way to work him into the movie considering he's Thor's nemesis in the mythos. Not to mention that it's because of him that a battle at Ragnarok is able to happen at all. You see, in the text it said that Jormungandr will enter a rage that'll trigger volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and cause the world's oceans to overtake the lands. These floods allow a ship called Nagalfar which is made of the untrimmed finger and toenails of the dead, disgusting, to finally set sail, with Loki at the helm and the forces of hell alongside him. Once Jormungandr arrives at the battlefield, he spits his venom into the air and sea, but he doesn't engage in the fighting until Thor shows up. Now, it's at this point that I would love to go into detail about their epic battle and talk about the various creative ways they caused each other pain and misery, but the Norse texts don't really give us anything to work with. All we're told is that Thor gets great renown for slaying the Midgard serpent, but only takes nine steps before Jormungandr uses his dying breath to vomit a massive amount of venom onto Thor and give him a truly agonizing death. So that is how their great rivalry ends, a stalemate, and while that wouldn't normally be very satisfying, for some reason it just seems fitting for a Norse myth. That being said, I do like the creative twist they put on their rivalry in God of War. It's basically the opposite of the mythos where instead of learning why Thor hates the serpent, we learn the serpent hates Thor and Odin because of how many of his fellow giants they've massacred. Why is he doing that? Odin had that statue made in honor of Thor. And seeing as the world serpent absolutely abhors the fat dobber, he was probably sick of looking at it. Sadly, we don't have a very clear idea of how Jormungandr is going to be involved in Ragnarok just yet, outside of him being partially frozen on the next game's cover, but we are told in 2018's God of War that during their fight, Thor hits him with Mjolnir so hard that Yggdrasil cracks and the serpent is sent backwards in time. It is said that when Jormungandr and Thor battle at Ragnarok, their clash so violently shakes the tree of life that it splinters casting the serpent backward through time, even before his own birth. What? That is madness. Well, I did say not to concern yourself. So it'll be really cool if we actually get to see that happen and how exactly that affects Thor, considering he's supposed to die while fighting the serpent in the mythos. I'm also curious if they're going to incorporate Loki being his father into the next game. My gut reaction is no, that wouldn't make any sense, but time works weird in their universe and he does say that Atria seems familiar to him. I'm sure it's nothing. He just said the boy seemed familiar to him. Me? That's impossible. Don't I quite agree. Unless, perhaps, he refers to something yet to be. Then again, that may just be because an older Atreus fights alongside him at Ragnarok. It's all speculation, of course, but I am hoping to get a review copy somehow so I can be ready to share the answers to those questions with you guys when the game is released and as soon as the embargoes are lifted. But anyway, that solo fam will do it for this episode on the mythology of Jormungandr. I really hope you enjoyed it and learned yourself something big pun intended. If that was the case, then make sure to sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons to your preferred pantheon. Not only does it give the channel a boost in the algorithm, but more content like this will be delivered right to your sub box and recommended feed. Those of you who want to give feedback to me directly can follow me on social media. Handles are right there and links are down below. Now that YouTube's officially hidden the dislike count, I'm more convinced than ever that I need to post content on more than just this dumpster fire of a platform and following me on social media would be a great way to stay updated on that. Also, also make sure to follow this Jormungandr, Gunther. He may not be as long as the World Serpent, but these broad shoulders could fill the Grand Canyon for sure. I will see you all again next week when I kick off our special end of the year holiday content with the origins of Jack Frost. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.